You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. The Feisty Heroine Romance Collection of Short Stories. Over 30 plus pulse racing shorts to capture your art with USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and award-winning authors in the mix. Paranormal, contemporary, fantasy, and historical romance that will whet your appetite with titillating heart-pounding tales you'll want to read again, then beg for more. Fall in love with your next book crush. Pre-order this amazing collection of shorts, over 30 pulse-pounding stories for only 99 cents. Proceed with caution. Buying this collection may lead to addictive reading, falling in love with your next book crush, and staying up past your bedtime to see what happens next. Get your limited edition copy of Feisty Heroines. Look for the link in the show notes of this episode. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my friend Dan, Dan Largent on the show with me today. He uh, is going to talk to us about these uh, phenomenal books that he's written before we ever spoke, and the new one is After Edgewater. Uh, these are such wide-ranging genre books. Um, I hate to uh to to give them one genre in the beginning because I know there's some great stories behind these books. Um but welcome to the show Dan. Well thank you so much for having me. It's it's been a real pleasure to uh be a guest on your show. Well thanks. Um well, Dan you you've listened to some shows so you know that we begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, as a child uh in elementary school my mom would bring me those blank books home. Uh, they were white hard covers with, you know, nothing on the inside and I would create stories and I loved to do it. I was really good at starting them and it was kind of, uh, appropriate for the way my, uh, career as an author is gone. I wasn't really good at finishing them as, as a younger man, but, uh, but I definitely had the, uh, the gumption to, to give it a shot. Well, in the, uh, in the dedication to, uh, before we ever spoke, you, uh, you tell your children that the book is for them, uh, and uh, said so you you began it before um, they were born, and then you finished it because of them, and then you you thank your your wife April, uh, and you uh, you thank your mother, and you said, and, and I don't remember, I don't have it right in front of me, but you said that she was 
um, y- your uh, creative role model uh, or something to that effect. Um, t- tell me about your mother's influence uh, on on your creative uh, life. Well, I can tell you that my mom is a is a lifelong uh, art teacher and artist, and uh, so she is always. Uh, really gone out of her way to make sure that we felt safe and comfortable in expressing our creativity. Uh, it didn't matter if I brought home a art project that probably wasn't that great. She was going to make me feel really good about that project. And so I always had the confidence to at least put myself out there. And, and I think that's the best compliment I could give her. Absolutely. Um, when, you know, we, we talk a lot on the show about the, the life of a writer can be, uh, you know, sometimes dark and solitary. It's just you and the, and the keyboard uh, a lot of times. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that early encouragement that you get from, from someone, uh, most of the time an adult who, um, you know, recognizes that gift in someone can really help power through a lot of those dark days. Yeah. You know what? It's, it, it, for me, it's 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 always been knowing that there's someone in my corner, and I've been lucky enough to have a lot of people in my corner to you know give me the confidence to to go for it and and to try it, and that and that's so important. I, I I like to tell people, and I know it's cliche, but everyone has a book in them. Every person on this planet has a book in them, and. If maybe my story helps inspire them to give it a shot on their own, which I already know it's it's done that for a few people, then I think that's the the greatest gift. Absolutely, um, Dan. What were some early um, books and or authors uh, who inspired you and kind of lit that storytelling fire in you? Well, I can tell you early on, uh, I loved this one book called Soccer Crazy. It was a kid's book, and I would read it cover to cover. Uh, Every time we went to the library, I would check out that book. And as I got older, uh, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing. uh, Uh, Fudge. Yeah, Fudge and Super Fudge. Oh, yeah. And then uh, as I got a little bit older, uh, I discovered Ernest Hemingway, and he is by far my my favorite author. Nice. Um, so you you had this des- this desire as a kid, and um, and you know worked it uh, all throughout. But at what point um, did you decide, uh, you know, that you needed a career path, and uh, what did you pursue as your as your day job? Well, I'm a teacher. I'm in my 20th year. Uh, I teach seventh grade uh, in in Olmstead Falls, Ohio, at Olmstead Falls Middle School. And uh, I I was also a coach, uh, football and baseball. I was a high school football coach, and I was the head baseball coach for a number of years at Olmstead Falls High School. So uh, that was my that was my passion, and it still is. And, And I and I I get to tell people that you know, in addition to you know, chasing down my, my dream of being a teacher and a coach, I, I get to, to also, you know, finish this other pursuit, which was writing a book. What subject do you teach? Uh, seventh grade world history. I used to teach English as well. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, right now I, I'm, I'm just a world history teacher. Gotcha. My, my son, my oldest son, Ian is a sixth grade English teacher. And, uh, yeah, I, I hear stories of, <laughs> uh, you know the interaction with kids, and uh, it it's uh, it seems to be a pretty wild ride. Yeah, you know what? I I am actually certified to teach grades one through eight. Uh, I did some student teaching in first grade, and I loved it. But I also knew that I was definitely not organized enough to be a primary <laughs> school teacher. Those people are saints. Oh, yeah. uh, but middle school, it, it's just you know what? It, it's never a dull moment. You have to be a special type of person to want to teach middle school, that's for sure, and have a lot of patience. And uh, But you know what? They're at that, that age, and, and I think back to seventh grade, and it was probably the hardest year of my life. And so I knowing that that's probably the way a lot of my students are feeling helps me kind of uh, help them navigate through the, that tough year. Yeah, yeah. Um, before we ever uh, spoke is the first book that you published, but is this the first novel? Um, that you started working on? Uh, yeah, actually, I, back in, uh, I think it 
think it was like 2005, I, I started writing writing the book, and I think I made it about eight chapters in, but it was a, it was a different book. Uh, and we ended up visiting my family down in Past Christiane, Mississippi, and uh, this was after Hurricane Katrina. I was just there this weekend. Oh, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. I, I had the, the, the joy of going down there last spring to help promote the book a little bit. And, and it was great to get back there and see all the places that, that I love. Uh, but we visited after Katrina and saw the devastation and having been there a lot before that, you know, I just, I just knew, you know, between family members that lost their house and, and everything else, it, it, it kind of gave me an idea on where I wanted this book to go because the, the main character of the book, Cooper Madison, even before Katrina, when I started writing it, he was from past Christian and, and it just kind of, you know, a light bulb went off for me, but there was just one issue and that's, we started having children in 2007 <laughs> and, uh, very familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. So from 2007 to 2015, we had three kids, Brooke, Grace, and Luke. And, uh, and so I didn't do a whole lot of writing and, uh, and it was around, uh, 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, I, I started getting more serious on it and decided, uh, you know what, I was going to be turning 40 soon. And I really wanted to, you know, check that item off a bucket list. And so I just decided to do it. And it was pretty much, you know, late nights, early mornings, hotel rooms, you know, whenever I could get a chance to type, I was doing it. Very few people knew I was writing it. I didn't want to be one of those guys who says, oh, I'm writing a book, I'm writing a book, and five years later, oh, I'm still writing a book. Right. And, and I, I just did not want to be like that. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't I didn't really tell anyone. Uh, I, my own mother didn't even know until about a week before it came out. Um, and, uh, I, and I went for it. And, and I'll never forget typing that last sentence and – uh, the, there was a well of emotion that came over me and, you know, it was, it was just whether, whether it sold any copies or not, I didn't care. It was done. And, and I wanted to show my kids that, Hey, you know what? It's never too late to chase your dreams and you know, you, you, you can accomplish them. Right. Um, 2017, 2018 is a really interesting time to, to finish a first book because, um, the indie revolution has has fully taken hold by that time, and uh, self publishing, you know, through Amazon and, and KDP, is is an absolutely viable uh, path to to publishing uh, at that point. Did um, I, did did you um, struggle with whether to self publish or whether to you know try to get an agent and trad publish or um, can talk about that decision if you will. Yeah, absolutely. It 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 was one of those things where I really honestly did not think anyone was going to read it. Um I did it solely for me and and for my kids and uh one of the people that read it was my favorite professor in college, uh Dr. James Gorman uh at Otterbein University and I had sent him the manuscript and he he gave me two pieces of advice. He said he thought it was, he thought it was really good. And he said, you could spend the next year, hire an agent, rewrite, you know, perfect it. And, and you're going to end up spending some money on an agent and things like that. Uh, and you, and it still might not get published. Uh, or you can just put it out yourself since this is really just what your goal was and then let it, and let's see what happens. And so that's what I did. And I can tell you that that tool um, for, for authors is just, it's just amazing. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I would have tried that even three or four years earlier, it, it wouldn't have been as easy as it was. Uh, I put very little money into the publishing of the first book. Uh, you know, I think I paid someone, you know, like $40 to design the cover and, uh, paid a, you know, an editor that I didn't even know, which I, which I ended up fixing in the second book because that had some issues with it. Um, but you know, there was a lot of learning that went with that first book. A lot of things I definitely wish I would have done differently. But then by the time the second book came out, I actually spoke to some literary agents and I had had a lot of success with the first book. And to be honest and to their credit, most of them said, Dan, like you have your audience, you know, you have control. I, I would stick with what you're doing. And so that's what I did. 
Absolutely. Um, the I, I alluded earlier to the fact that this uh, these books are really cross genre, um, yeah. and um, and and I absolutely love it. Um, I, I think we need more books like this, and I think that uh, and I think we need more books like this written by men, um, it, especially. Um, there's uh, I think there's a a, a giant hole um, lacking male voices in this space. <laughs> um, it's a uh, it, it's a sports book. It's a it's a romance, um, but not in the you know sappy Harlequin right. um, vein. Um, talk a little bit about um, why you chose to write the kind of story that you wrote. Well, I, I think I'm a hopeless romantic at heart. Uh, I, I, I definitely think that. Um, I, I am an unabashed uh, rom com fan. <laughs> um, however, uh, you know I. I I wanted it to be a book that not only I would want to read, which I know is what all authors say, but I wanted it to be something that anyone, if they picked it up, they could find something in it that they liked, whether it was the sports aspect, the love aspect, or the, the crime, uh, you know, the crime aspect with the, with the serial killer and, and how the story's all intertwined. And I wanted to make sure that there were some twists and turns and, and uh, you know, all the, all the things that, uh, that, that I like to read from other authors. Right. Well, every great book uh, begins with uh, with a couple of characters uh, that we can uh, latch on to, that we can relate to, that we can you know learn to to root for and to love. And you bring us Cooper Madison and Kara Knox. Uh, <laughs> and Coop is uh, uh, he's an interesting fellow. And uh, yeah. as you mentioned, originally from past Christiane, um, winds up in, in Cleveland. Um, tell us how these two characters came about and were, did you have them before their story kind of, uh, you know, opened up to you around them? You know, I, I, I would say that I had an idea, but as I wrote the stories and even into the second book, I would say that I didn't really know where Cooper and care were going to go, even as I was writing the second book. And, and I know there will be a third book eventually to, to kind of complete the series. And, uh, I'm sure there's still some, some more discovery on my end. Uh, but I would say that Cooper Madison is probably, you know, the guy that, that every, you know, guy kind of wants to be, you know, he's the, the, the strong athletic, uh, top of his game, but he's still, you know, somewhat grounded. Uh, he's not perfect. He makes mistakes. Uh, but he's, uh, you know, he's he's kind of what you would, I think, if you were saying, man, if I could live the perfect life, for the most part, I think a lot of guys would would choose a guy like Cooper Madison. Uh, but he still has vulnerability, and uh, and I and I think that shows through. And and Kara, you know. I think she is, uh, she's a composite of a lot of people. Um, she's definitely a composite of my wife, uh, April. Um, but she's also, uh, you know, what I, what I try to do with her is, is, is give, give a strong, uh, female character that wouldn't be in awe of Coop and would be able to dish it out as well as, uh, as take it. Is it important for you to to have strong women um, in your books? Because Kara is, like you said, you know she can she can dish it out as well as take it, and she can go toe to toe with Coop. Um, <laughs> yeah, is, is she kind of a reflection of of your mom's influence? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, my mom's been through a lot in her life, and uh, you know, and 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 she just is. Uh, uh, the pinnacle of strength, uh, in my mind. And, uh, you know, and she has a good sense of humor, uh, and, you know, and I have five sisters, um, and, you know, there is, there, there is definitely, uh, an, an importance on my end to make sure that I have strong female characters in my books. And, and we, you know, we meet another one in the second book who, uh, who, uh, who I really enjoyed creating. And, and, and I think that that's important. Right. Right. So, so tell me about how the story came about. So we've got Coop and Kara, <laughs> um, you know, how do you, in, in writing that first book, cause you'd never written a novel before. No. <laughs> um, how did you start to find the story thread 
And uh, did you begin with them and then just kind of events started adding and and, and growing? Uh, talk to us a little bit about the creative process you went through. Yeah, you know, I'm I, I, what I, what I did was I, I definitely had the idea in mind that you know Cooper Madison was going to be this you know professional athlete who walked away from the game at the at the height of his career and and he's you know kind of become a recluse and uh, Cleveland is a is the type of town where someone like that could definitely hide a little bit uh, and. I knew that I wanted him to have a love interest and I wanted it to be someone who wouldn't have known who Cooper Madison was before she met him. And that's, that's kind of where it started. And then I needed to make sure that I built their world around them. And, uh, Kara's family, uh, I think is, is provides a lot of dynamic uh to who she is and and the woman the young woman she's become and and you could say the same for coop as well right um then another uh character comes in kara's older brother Mm -hmm. uh who is uh jason um, yeah yeah, jason who is is a police officer um, a detective even yep. and um, we bring even more trouble uh, into the story. <laughs> Tell us about that that story thread and why um, that became important to you to weave in. Well, you know, I I knew that I wanted there to be something other than just the love story, uh, and and so when I got about a third of the way through, I had already written in Jason as being a detective, just but only in mention. And that's where the idea for the EPK or Edgewater Park Killer came into play. And I, you know, I, I took some criticism from people who uh, said that, you know, they wished I would have introduced that character earlier in the story. I purposely didn't because I wanted the everything else to already be in place and I wanted it to be unique. And, and so that's why I purposely waited uh, to bring the EPK in. And I, and I think that it does a good job of, you know, making the last half of the book go pretty quick um, when you start, you know, throwing in that storyline and, and, and you see how all three main characters, their stories weave together. Well, you know, there's a, um, uh, there, there's a school of thought, and, and I think that's where some of the feedback that you, you were getting uh, is that uh, – the school of thought would be, well, if it's going to be a thriller or a police procedural, yeah. put that right up front so people can, you know, start uh, working on the puzzles in, in, in the back of their mind, maybe. Um, but no, you you just – we hang a, a major left turn uh, yeah. in the middle of the book there, and I actually love that. I think oh, – I appreciate uh, that. Because you're just like completely taken off guard, and you're like, oh, okay, so this is what kind of <laughs> book we're doing. Okay. And uh, yep. I, I think more authors need to take chances like that. Yeah, and you know what? And I had the uh, I had the luxury of not writing it to please anyone. Uh, you know, especially being my first book and and not really knowing what was going to go on with it. I I, I I didn't have a editor telling me no, you need to do this or or anything like that. And so I, I just kind of made it my own, and and it was definitely a little bit of a risk. But it's also you know, as many people that have said they wish I would have brought it in earlier, uh, there's as, just as many who said that they loved that it came in late, uh, just as you did, and, and I really appreciate that. Well, well and to you know, to to be fair, um, that it might not always work. You know, if no. you're <laughs> if you're going to start a book off and it's going to be, um, uh, you know, a um, I'm trying to grab an example here it, that it's going to be a psychological thriller. And then in the middle of the book, it all of a sudden becomes a comedy. That's right. obviously not going to yeah, work, no, but no. but you have established this emotional connection. And then this just serves to amp that up. Um, it, it, uh, you know, it, it serves to take it to another level. It actually enhances what you've already done. Well, yeah. I, well, first of all, I appreciate that. And, and, and secondly, you know, it, it, it was one of those things where like I, I even put like a little there's like a little Easter egg. If you look at the cover closely uh, on before we ever spoke, you can see the silhouette of a guy and you can realize, oh, maybe I uh, if I would have looked a little more closely that maybe I would know that that there was something like that coming in. And uh, and so the 
those, those like little surprises and stuff were really fun for me as an author. And, and, and I, and I think most authors would say like, they love, they love knowing when a, when a reader is kind of caught off guard in a good way. Right. Right. Well, back to what I mentioned earlier when Mm. I, um, uh, brought up the, the introduction to the book and you said that, that, uh, you started the book before uh, your kids were born, but you finished it because of them. Tell me about the, uh, the motivation to get this book finished and, and, uh, what that was like. Well, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned before I was, I was, you know, turning 40 as I was starting to finish it. And, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to be able to have something tangible, uh, to, to leave, my kids and, 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 you know, they're, they're too young to, to read these books right now. Uh, my oldest is 12. Um, so, you know, at some point they'll read them and, uh, and I want, I wanted them to actually, you know, have it and, and be able to hold it. And, uh, we you know when that first box of proofs came, uh, oh, yeah, that's a good you know, that, that was, that, I, that was amazing. And, uh, and, you know, and being able to, to hand them the book and even my four year old son, you know, when he sees a, one of my books, you know, he, he immediately goes, dad, dad that's your book. That's your book, dad. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's pretty awesome. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, we talked about the publishing of the book. Um, when did you realize that this book had found an audience? <laughs> Well, when I put it out, uh, I really, the only prom- promotion I did was posting some stuff on Facebook and to, to some friends like, Hey, by the way, I wrote a book and it's, you know, here's the link, Let, you know, if, if you're, if you're interested and, and it up until that point, uh, I really didn't care or I would like to say I didn't care what, what people thought of it or anything because I had accomplished my goal or at least in my head I had. And I was, was of course kidding myself because as soon as that book went live and as soon as I started getting initial numbers of, you know, I think of the first day, it was like, you know, your first day or two is like a hundred copies and, and, I, and I'm sitting there going, Oh my God, people are buying this book <laughs> and they're actually going to read it. And then they're, you know, they're going to be able to, to sit, you know, say if they liked it or didn't like it. And I remember being, being pretty sick that first day or so, uh, just, you know, uh, because I had been kidding myself that I didn't care, but because anyone who puts themselves out there, of course they care. Otherwise you wouldn't put yourself out there. And, and so once, uh, I started to get some feedback and, and there's a, there's a couple of people who immediately read it. And, uh, as they were reading it, uh, God bless them. They were, they were texting me and telling me, you know, what they liked and, and, and this and that and the other. And that made me feel uh, a little better about it. And, uh, and I tell them all the time that, you know, they were, they were lifesavers. They were like guardian angels. Uh, I even worked their names into some characters in the second book as a thank you, uh, because that really helped put my mind at ease. And, and then when the first reviews started coming in, uh, not just from people who read it, but from, you know, review blogs and things like that. And they were, you know, all, you know, five stars, you know, four star, five star reviews. And I, I went, wow, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I might have something here. And, and I had taken a couple weeks off after it was published. And then I started writing the second one. And 11 months later, it came out. <laughs> well, I, I was about to ask you, um, did you did you have the second book in mind when you finished the first one? Or was it just, OK, uh, I, I found something here. Let me continue the story. Yeah. You know, I, when I finished the first book and it has an ending without giving anything away where, you know, even if it was a standalone book, uh, sometimes unanswered questions are, are okay. And sure. you leave it up to the reader to figure it out and, and to come up with their own version of, of what, what exactly happened. But I also knew when I ended it, okay, well, if maybe this, you know, by chance, you know, this does do well and people like it, I, I did have an idea of where I wanted it to go. Um, but I am definitely not, uh, someone who does a lot of pre-writing. Uh, I think of things and I use the, the voice note function on my phone. So I remind myself so I don't forget it. Uh, I, when I'm on a long drive, I listen to music and I just think of where my stories could go. And and that's where I come up with the ideas and, and and I just write and, and then I, you can always go back and change things. And, and and that's kind of my process. I'm just one of those guys who just sits down and, and just go. Uh, and, and it, and it goes in spurts. Um, but I, I definitely, 
uh, like to let it happen organically as, as I'm creating the story. Well, when uh, in the second book, um, you know, we we see Coop and uh, and Kara and Jason return um, because you've got a, a, a pre-built world um, air mm-hmm. quotes here with my finger. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, the um, was it easier to get into this because you you don't have to to lay all that groundwork again like you have to do in the first book? Yes, uh, it was the first I would say the first 20 chapters were extremely easy. Uh we had an unusually long summer last year, uh, based off our school start date being delayed a little bit. So by the time school started, I, you know, it was like mid to late June when I started writing it. And by the beginning of September, I think I was 40, 45 chapters in and the, and I think the final copy had, you know, 93, 94, something like that. So I was about halfway done with the book, um, by September, but then I hit kind of a wall because, uh, you know, life, you know, going back to work and teaching and not having all day in the summer to, to, to pound out some chapters and things like that. But, but also just, uh, I think creatively I, I started getting to a point where I didn't really like the direction the book went and I ended up deleting 10 chapters and going back and, and, you know, picking it up where, where, where I left off. And, and it, it, it was definitely, uh, easier to start. It was, it was tough in the middle, but then when I, when I got it in my head, I couldn't type fast enough. Those, uh, those 10 chapters that you delete, man, that's painful to do. But but when you, when you realize that, um, uh, that the story went in the wrong direction and you pick up the the right direction, man, that's an energizing uh, feeling, isn't it? It was, it, you know, at first when I deleted them, I, you know, I copied them and put them in a separate document just in case I had regrets. Uh, but, but then once I got cooking, uh, there was no looking back and, and I ended up just getting rid of them all together. Uh, but yeah, it definitely was a, it was one of those moments where it was like, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I, I, I wanted to stay true to, to, to where the story should go. I didn't want it to be cliche and I, and I felt like it was going to, I think I, I felt like I was starting to wade into those waters of predictability and and I and that's like the one thing I can't stand when I read a book or or watch a movie or a TV show is predictability. I, I don't like being able to predict what's going to happen at all times. Right. Um, the 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 cover for After Edgewater um, mm-hmm. is a little darker. It's yep. uh, it's a little grittier. Um, the the story reads um, a little mm-hmm. grittier and a little. There, there's more tension on the page, um, yeah. like like right out of the gate. You know the um, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the kind of warm, happy beginning of the first <laughs> book. Um, we don't get that that ease in and introduction. We're kind of right into the thick of it with After Edgewater. What uh, talk a little bit about the tone of this book and how it differs from the first book and. Did the tone, did, did the writing feel different in the second than the first? It, it definitely felt different. Uh, and, and purposely so I, you know, I, I kind of, I, I, when I look at these books and with the third book in mind, I kind of look at it like a relationship, you know, at the beginning of the relationship, it's, you know, it's all sunshine and rainbows and, right. and everything's great and it's feel good and warm and fuzzy. And then, you know, then, yes. And then you get past that part and it gets real. And, uh, so I wanted the second book to be real. I wanted it to be, uh, you know, not necessarily darker, but definitely grittier and, and, Obviously, the EPK case gets tied in, you know, right away. Uh, so throughout the book, you don't have to wait for it on this one. Uh, and, and you know, with the thought in mind that, you know, the the third book will, it, you know, if, if the readers of the fir- people who really like the first book more because it was a little lighter, you know, I think they'll they'll be they'll be very happy with the third book uh, because, you know, it's going to be almost like a, uh, you know, like like a sandwich of sorts, you know, where we're in the middle. It's, it's, it's definitely the, you know, a little darker, but, uh, definitely more realistic. And, and I think I grew as a writer, uh, 
quite frankly, you know, just based off of feedback and, and, uh, had a, a great editor on the second book. She's a former colleague of mine, uh, Nancy Golden. She was a, a English teacher for, you know, 30 years and she had read the first book and I talked to a book club that she was in and I thought what better person to be the editor on the second book than her. And she had edited some books before and, and so, uh, she really helped me, um, you know, kind of mold the, the story into what it became. Nice. Nice. Um, in writing the second book, uh, and I, I know that you said you're not a, a, a plotter, uh, not an outliner. Um, but you know, when you're working on a trilogy and, and this is something that I struggle with as well, because I'm, I'm more in the, in the, you know, pants or, uh, uh, camp than I am the, the plotter camp. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're, and I'm working on a trilogy right now, um, you know, f making sure that you keep things, uh, <laughs> together and organized and yes. your ultimate goal that you're looking for at the end of book three, um, you know, can we get to this satisfying ending over here? How do I build tension in book two that leads into book three? Um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, as you're go uh, going through that and, and the writing of book two, um, how do you keep that end goal in mind? Well, you know, the only type of structure, I guess, to my to my writing process is I keep a spreadsheet of every chapter, you know, the main idea of the chapter and the characters, especially new characters that are introduced, but which characters are in the chapter. And, you know, when you there, there are a lot of characters in my books. Some are, you know, you only see for a page or two and others, you know, throughout. Uh, so, you know, just making sure I keep track of all the names the right way and, and things like that. Uh, but it is, um, it, that does help me when I, when I put it down and I can see our, you know, on a, on a spreadsheet, the, the flow of the book, you know, just from the, the main idea of each chapter and, and, and just trying to make sure that I'm okay. I went three chapters without, you know, discussing this and we need to make sure that we get this in here and, and so on and so forth. I think that helps keep me on track. Um, but, uh, but that would be about as, as much as I put into it in regards to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I love it. Um, the, the book, uh, after Edgewater, um, has a satisfying ending. Um, yeah. and you can, um, you know, these are books that you could, you need to read them in order, but if someone picked up the second book and read it and wasn't aware that there was a first book, I think this right. could be a satisfying read for them out of order. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, that was kind of my goal. And I think that's, uh, you know, early on, you know, just, I, one thing I've learned from from a lot of authors that I've that I've read or listened to, uh, you know, when when they are doing those trilogies, I always notice that they make sure that if it's the second book or the third book that, you know, they, they put stuff in there so that if someone had just picked up that book on accident out of order, that uh, they wouldn't be completely lost. I didn't want it to be one of those where, you know, oh, if you didn't read the first, then this one isn't isn't going to be any good to you. I think that that they would be able to pick it up and read it and, and then hopefully want to go back and get the first book. Um, but yeah, I, and, and putting in the, you know, I'd never done a, a prologue or an epilogue before. And, uh, uh, but I wanted to do that to kind of give a hint, uh, to the reader as to, to what could be coming in the third book and, and also to give them a glimpse because those first two books, they, they take place in 2006 and, you know, and so, I know that if I was reading them, I, I was trying to put myself in the reader's shoes. And if I was reading them, I'd want to know, okay, where, where is Cooper Madison in 2020? You know, where is he now? And, uh, where's Kara Knox now? And so, you know, I, I, that's why I wanted to give the, a little, a little hint, but there's, you know, the door is wide open for, for what happens during that, uh, you know, 13 or 14 year period. <laughs> sure. Sure. Are you, uh, are you actively working on, uh, on book three? Uh, I, I, I took a lot of time off because I, I, I did, you know, basically two books in, in two years is really what it came down to. And, uh, so I, I, I took a lot of time off. Uh, I did not type a word over the summer. Uh, I just decided to spend, you know, every minute I could with my kids, they're getting older. Uh, and, and, you know, so I, I did very little in regards to that, but as things would come into my head, I would jot down notes and, and stuff. And I finally just last month started typing the third book. And, and I think I, I I'm not 
I'm not trying to get it out super fast. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, still have to catch up to the second book. And, um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm giving it some time and uh, I'm hoping by sometime in 2021 to have the third book out. Uh, I'm also working on a, a nonfiction book right now, which I can't really go into um, uh, just yet. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a memoir uh, for someone and it's a, someone who's pretty well known. And so that's a totally different type of writing. Uh, but, uh, but it's been really fun to work on and, and it's helping me grow as a writer as well. You know, trying to put someone else's, you know, words onto paper in their voice, not yours, you know, and that that's provided some challenges at times, but it's also really helped me, uh, as a writer. Well, it, it, it definitely adds tools to the writer toolbox. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And interviewing tools too. That's exactly. it, you're the expert at that. Not me, Hank. And oh. so doing the interview part was, is, has been, uh, definitely opening. you know, making sure I'm asking the right questions and, right. and stuff like that. So, well, it's a, it, it definitely adds skills that you never, um, thought you needed and, yes. and, and, and until you have them and you're like, Oh, well that's, that's handy. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and just writing in someone else's voice. I mean, you know, I don't want someone to pick that book up and, and I don't want them to know that I wrote it. I want them to, to think that the, the, the person who's the book's about is the one who typed the words, you know, exactly. and, and, and that's, that's a, it's challenging, but it's also very rewarding. It's, it's been really, uh, it's been really a, a neat thing for me to be a part of. Right. Um, I, I listened to the audio book of before we ever spoke and absolutely loved it. Um, are we going to see after Edgewater in audio? Uh, possibly. Um, at, at first, um, you know, when I did the, that was another bucket list item. I love audible. Yeah. Uh, I, I listened to audible. I, 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 I go through both. That's how I, that's how I can read to be quite honest with, with my lifestyle. And, you know, Me if I'm too. at my kids volleyball tournament all day, I'll throw my headphones in and listen. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's been a lifesaver for me to make sure that I'm still getting exposed to great writers. And, uh, and so I wanted to have my book on. And, uh, so I did the first book and, um, I think eventually I'll probably have the second one on there. Uh, and, and then, you know, the third one, but, uh, nothing in the works right now. Um, but, uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if down the road it is. Excellent. I look forward to it. Um, the, the books before we ever spoke and after Edgewater are available now on Amazon. There's links to them in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Dan, I'm a huge fan, um, uh, uh, not just the books, but of you, uh, in particular, um, if people want to find out more about you and, and dig into all the great stuff you do, is there a place they can connect with you online? Yeah, definitely. First of all, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's www.danlargent.com, D-A-N-L-A-R-G-E-N-T.com. And uh, they can follow me on Twitter. That's at O-F Baseball, O-F Baseball on Twitter. And uh, that's uh, the probably the best places to, uh, to find out more. Excellent. We'll include links to those in the show notes. Dan, this has been uh, great fun talking, and uh, thank you for doing what you do. Hank, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The near future. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, The probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, 
choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? he murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. 
His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. How? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen, the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to Some things you write now, uh, do they differ in the writing process from, uh, from... Plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.